Coming up on DTNS, breaking news about breaking Galaxy Fold Zs, how to get a ride into space in the next couple of years, even if you aren't an astronaut, and should we raise cows on the water? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, February 18th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were uh, discussing a little text message etiquette. Is it okay to just say, hey, in a text message? If you want that and discussions of ice cream and more, go get Good Day Internet, the wider show at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Bloomberg reports that launch of a new low-cost iPhone SE is still on track to happen in March. An updated iPad Pro with a new camera module could still be delayed or constrained. Outside possibilities also include an updated 13-inch MacBook Pro, a new MacBook Air, AirTags trackers for your items that work on ultra-wide band, and a wireless charging mat. TF Securities analyst Ming-Chi Kuo's sources say that Apple will ramp up production of AirTags in Q2 or Q3 of this year. Yeah, we figured out why NVIDIA and Activision Blizzard were fighting, and it wasn't because what Scott and I thought last week. Verge reports that it was a misunderstanding between Activision and Blizzard over the GeForce Now service. NVIDIA thought it had permission to keep Battle.net games going during the free trial, but it was mistaken. Bloomberg sources say Activision Blizzard wants a commercial agreement, which would mean maybe having to pay twice, and NVIDIA doesn't want any commercial agreements regarding our speculation that this had to do with stadia it appears not an activision blizzard spokesperson told the verge that the company is focusing quote specifically on youtube and google cloud Microsoft released its all-in-one Office app for Android to everyone. The app combines Android versions of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. It lets you browse files in OneDrive. It also syncs with Windows 10 Notes and includes Office lens scanners and a QR code reader. The app is locked in portrait mode and has no UI for tablets or Chromebooks. And a report in Nature describes a device called AirGen, created by electrical engineer Jun Yao and microbiologist Derek Lovely at UMass Amherst, that generated electricity from the moisture in the air. This could be big. Electrically conductive nanowire produced by the microbe Geobacter interacts with naturally present water vapor to create current. They say it works even in low humidity conditions like those found in the Sahara Desert. You don't need it to be in a particularly humid place. The Air Gen can power small electronics right now, like your wearables, and should reach commercial scale in productivity fairly soon. So keep an eye out for that. That's amazing. Dell announced it's selling RSA security to a private equity consortium for $2.075 billion. The transaction includes RSA Archer, RSA Net Witness Platform, RSA Secure ID, RSA Fraud and Risk Intelligence, and RSA Conference. The sale is expected to close in the next six to nine months. And Kickstarter employees voted 46 to 37 to form a union with the Office and Professional Employees International. Kickstarter workers are the first white collar workers at a major tech company to successfully unionize in the United States. Uh, there's been like uh, uh, food workers at Google and, uh, and other tech companies that have had unions, but this is the first in the in the white collar tier. Kickstarter CEO Aziz Hassan said in a statement, we support and respect this decision and we are proud of the fair and democratic process that got us here. Doesn't say whether he had his teeth clenched or not. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more about a new Qualcomm modem. Oh, let's. Qualcomm unveiled its 5 nanometer Snapdragon X60 5G modem, which he says, which it says is the first to offer carrier aggregation for signals sent over sub 6 gigahertz and millimeter wave variants of 5G networks. This would let a carrier send data over multiple bands at once, leading to faster speeds overall. Samples of the X60 5G modem will go out in Q1 and are expected to show up in phones in early 20 2021. Yeah, this confused me at first when I saw the headline come across the feeds uh, because there is a Qualcomm modem out right now that supports millimeter wave and sub six G sub six gigahertz, um, but the phone can only use one at a time. Uh, it can switch back and forth even on the same carrier, but it can only connect to one at a time. This new X60 5G modem can bond the connection, so essentially it can send the data through both the millimeter wave and the sub six gigahertz. Uh, and whenever you bond a connection like that, you you effectively raise the potential capacity and the potential speed. Uh, so that's a pretty significant thing. It's, it's interesting that we're gonna take a year to get this into phones, um, but it, it, 
it's not going to be something, it's going to be hard to market this. It's, you're just going to say like with a faster modem connection and carriers are going to have to right. exploit yeah. it. And, it. It's hard to make yeah. this like a one-liner marketing thing. Yeah. People are like, I don't know, are my speeds faster? Qualcomm's like, yes, but there's more to it. <laughs> yeah. So it, yeah. How is this going to work? Qualcomm is going to sample these out. Uh, manufacturers are going to work with the carriers who can do this. Some carriers will want to do carrier aggregation. Some won't. Uh, you know, something like Google Fi uh, might be able to to use this. Then they're going to say, okay, these devices, these manufacturers will make them partnered with these carriers, and then it's going to have to come from the carriers. I think. I'm I'm sure some announcements from de from device makers might mention that they have the ability to do carrier aggregation with the X65G modem inside, uh, but you're going to have to get a carrier that takes advantage of it for it to be worth bothering with. Yeah, I mean, the fact that Qualcomm is the first is significant, but really this just means that eventually this is something that that carriers can take advantage of and consumers will benefit from. I'm hoping more carriers do this. They don't always, because carrier aggregation isn't new. You could do it on 4G, you can do it on, on 3G and even 2G. And in fact, the X65G, as, as you mentioned on Daily Tech Headlines today, can handle all the way back to 2G, so you could aggregate all over the place. Yeah. Uh, but carriers don't always want to do the work for that. One of the elements of Samsung's foldable Galaxy Z Flip was that it uses glass instead of plastic in the screen, which implied that maybe it would be more durable. However, it does not appear that it is extremely durable. Well, let's review. Uh, YouTube reviewer Zach Nelson uh, does a regular screen test uh, where he takes progressively more destructive things, you know, like a pen and then, you know, up to a, a cardboard cutter to the screen to see if it can scratch it. Uh, he has levels that that he has calibrated. Uh, most smartphones don't show scratches till he gets to level six or seven. He's reusing some really sharp stuff. The Galaxy Z Flip started showing scratches at level two. Now, Samsung told The Verge that the ultra-thin glass used in the Galaxy Z Flip has a protective layer on top, implying that the scratches seen at level two are similar to scratches seen on plastic screens because it's that plastic layer on top that's getting scratched. Samsung said it will offer one-time free application of a screen protector on the Z Flip and has a screen replacement program where you pay 119 bucks to replace your screen if it breaks. Uh, speaking of breaking, there's some reports of cracking of the screen. Nothing with the hinge in this one, but a Twitter uh, user cracked his Z Flip right out of the box, thinking it might have been because of the cold weather. Uh, and CNET's three-foot drop test shattered the glass as well. Again, the hinge seems to be fine in this thing, and it's not like these things are breaking all over the place, uh, right and left, but they aren't holding up to the same level of durability tests that a normal smartphone would hold up to. Yeah, before the show, I was, you know, my, my takeaway was sort of just like, are we just trying to make this new form factor happen and it's not going to happen? <laughs> it's not making Flip happen. But at the same time, you bring up a good point, Tom, uh, and Roger had said the same thing, too, that... If if there's if there's a certain form factor under so much scrutiny that there are all these tests being done to be like, and look, there are scratches on it. It's like, I mean, my phone is scratched in lots of places because I just dropped it out of my pocket. I mean, it's not as if the, you know, the, the flat form factor has been, uh, you know, great to me. Um, I like the idea of something being able to fold shut. I think in general, that actually is the safer way to go about things. But again, these are early days and companies are trying to figure out what the what the sweet spots are. Yeah, this is a great example of headline creep, of outrage creep, uh, where originally the problem with the Galaxy Fold was the hinge was breaking and there was a problem with the plastic screen. Uh, this is a different problem. It's a problem with the screen being scratched or the glass breaking. And uh, people are sort of seem to be equating it to the galaxy like oh it's just as bad as the galaxy fold and it's not it doesn't doesn't mean it's good we could we have to have you know more than two approaches to to understand this properly it's not good in other words it's not going to be as durable as your current phone but your current phone isn't perfectly durable and yet it's also not as bad as this thing breaks all the time it means if you buy a Gal galaxy z flip you need to be gentle with it and if you're the kind of person who's hard on phone screens maybe it's not the phone for you yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. Uh, the, Especially when you get into these premium prices. It's like, you know, someone being like, oh, what oh, yeah. do you expect? What do you, you want to throw it around and it's just not going to break? It's like, this is this is a, 
a, a precious, delicate item. Does a lot of stuff. I might mean, make your life better. Got to treat it with care. It's like someone who would uh, take a, a phone from, say, like the old, uh, the old, the old flip phone, and then compare it to a smartphone where you're right. just doing a drop test with that. It's like, oh, I, I dropped my flip phone. I've dropped my flip phone out of a first story or second story window, and it broke. the The battery came out, but I could put it back together, and it ran just fine. Uh, I couldn't do that with my smartphone, and I'm not going to say, "Oh, my smartphone, my actually my Pixel 3a is defective because it did not survive a two-story fall." <laughs> right, right, exactly. It's just a different kind of phone. You just have to keep that in mind. All right, guys, would you like to go to space? Is that a threat? <laughs> Well, depends. Depends. I'll read you the rest of the story. SpaceX right. plans to send four private citizens, could be you, into orbit at the top of 2021 or early, uh, at the end of 2021, rather, or early 2022. Space Adventures, which has helped seven private citizens visit space, will help with this project. The tourists will fly in a Dragon capsule at around the same height as the International Space Station, orbit two to three times and then return back to Earth. The first crewed Dragon flight is supposed to take place with NASA astronauts on board later this year. Now, SpaceX also has a contract with Japanese billionaire Yuzaku Mizawa to fly around the moon on the future Big Falcon rocket. In fact, that's been in place for some time, but hasn't happened yet. Both, both Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic are planning suborbital flights to let paying customers experience weightlessness. But this is a little bit beyond that. Yeah, they're going higher than Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic still says they're going to do theirs by the end of the year. Uh, the 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 flight around the moon was supposed to happen in 2018. It didn't. There's no date on that yet. But because they're actually testing the Dragon capsule with astronauts, seems possible that you could have private citizens going up in this thing, at least in 2022. And if Virgin Galactic is starting to do its tourist flights into suborbit for weightlessness, if Blue Origin starts doing their flights next year, uh, by the t you know two years from now, uh, it might be a luxury item, but the idea of being able to pay to go into space uh, as a joyride might mm -hmm. be normal. It might be a thing that is you know accepted rather than a weird thing that's only happened a few times because of that company Space Adventures. Yeah, and so the the next qu obvious question, and I have I've been on the show in the past, and I know people. Go ahead and flame me if you like. I have no desire to go to space. I am never going to do this. Uh, the The idea fills me with anxiety. I just want to stay on Earth where I belong. But for people who do want to go, how much is it going to cost? And how long are you up there? And those are questions that we don't know the answers to yet. Well, two to three times orbit, you're not up there for very long. Uh, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, they're just going suborbital to get you a little wee, I'm, I'm weightless, and then mm. back down. So none of these are very long, but how much? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you have to ask, you probably can't afford it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, and it's, I will add this uh, in some ways is the next step from the current level of exotic ride for a lot of money where you can fly into so, uh, an ex Russian Air Force fighter and they take you to the edge of space in a pressure suit and stuff. And it lasts maybe an hour, but I mean, you pay a, a big stack of cash, but yeah. you get to brag. I went to the edge of space in a in a in a Russian. Well, that's what fighter. Virgin Galactic yeah. is doing. Same same type of thing. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see all the humble brags when this comes around. Yeah, I am. I am skeptical that all of these plans will happen on time. That's yeah. what I say. How about cows on a boat? How about it? That's actually not a boat though. Wired's Laura Maloney has an article about a floating cow for farm. Uh, from a property development company called Belladon in Rotterdam Harbor in the Netherlands. Uh, the aim is to demonstrate a possible sustainable food source. Uh, the idea came to the owner of Belladon, Peter Van Wingarden, when he saw the disruption to the food supply in New York during Hurricane Sandy. And he's like, maybe for food security, we should develop floating farms. So he did a 4,943 square foot stable floating on concrete pontoons anchored into the seabed. Uh, cows eat potato peels and grass clippings. Waste is turned into fertilizer for park grass, uh, like soccer fields or just, you know, meadows, uh, that then provides the clippings for the food and milk from the cows is bottled or made into yogurt. Uh, the farm appears to be too expensive to replicate and widely, or to replicate widely anyway, and relies on too many resources outside of the cows. So there's a lot of maintenance when you're out on the seawater. Uh, power, 
it doesn't make its own power. Uh, I know, you know, you're thinking cows, obviously there's a power source there in methane, uh, but they haven't figured that out yet. So to maintain sustainability uh, is a challenge, but Belladon founder Peter Van Wingarden hopes the experiment will spark more creative thinking about food sustainability. Yeah, and for anybody who's like, why well, you're putting a bunch of cows on a pontoon, that's mean. The cows can come and go. This is a almost 5,000 square foot area for the cows to eat and it's the state. Do, do, yeah, do their yeah. do their business but they they can they can go uh to uh, to and from land um if they have a ticket <laughs> right? if they're rich enough but uh but and also it was interesting i guess in the early stages of of testing this out the a, a large question was do the cows want to do this because if they're going to get seasick <laughs> like let's not do this to the cows cows seem okay Cows are like, all right, we we got it. You know, they're they're pretty resilient creatures. But uh, it it's interesting to me that this would be so expensive to replicate. I understand that if you don't, I mean, the Netherlands is you know it, it, below sea level majority wise, and you know covered in water. So this is a perfect place to to try something like this out. There are lots of other places in the world where this would work. And and places that it wouldn't. So you can't just say, yeah, we're just gonna, you know, build all the stuff, you know, on you know every little lake around here. Of course that wouldn't work. But uh, I I wonder what is so cost prohibitive at this point. It's, it probably has yeah. a lot to do with power. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. But as I mentioned, the maintenance, you know, uh, seawater uh, corrodes things. You have to do a lot of maintenance to keep just a, a regular old boat in shape, mm -hmm. or you know, an oil derrick, uh, and and so. You don't have any sustainability in that stuff. Uh, there's not sustainable power. There's not, you know, the cows don't provide any maintenance. So you have to pay other people. <laughs> yeah. to well, they're not do earning that. their keep. I mean, yeah. it, it could go, it doesn't necessarily have to be cows either. It could be like a hydroponics setup oh, sure. where, you're, yeah. where you're, you're growing crops. But it would be the same maintenance and power issues probably maybe well, less power i don't know less power i mean if you can get some yeah. uh, if you can get some solar cells on top you can actually do kind of some sort of preventive galvanic corrosion on the device by running cu a current through uh through the uh, superstructure See? that's there, what peter van wingarden is hoping people will do by doing I, this this way he's like maybe maybe i'll inspire roger chang to improve on my design I, i'm thinking this might be a better fit for aquaculture whether it's something mm -hmm. like uh raising oysters oyster you know a mobile floating oyster bed that you're not tied up next door but you let float and then let the waves carry in whatever uh or there's you know, already stuff like that with yeah. oyster beds but yeah, you, yeah there's those oyster beds are, are currently fixed like they're fixed from offshore, so you walk down. And but if you could have it floating, you could. Well, these are fixed too. They're fixed to the. Well, I, I mean, that's that's my thing. Is like if they could get it, so it could, you could have it float. You could lessen the impact of things like uh, fish farms and stuff to have currently in um, uh, inshore areas. Well, starting this week, Ring will require all users humans or cows, to use second factor authentication when logging in. Users will be offered text message or email to receive a six digit code. Ring also introduced new options for controlling when data is shared with third parties. You can turn off sharing data with companies that create personalized ads as well. And data sharing with analytic services is paused while Ring works on an opt out system that's gonna work best for everybody. Last month, Ring added a privacy dashboard and options to control whether or not police can request footage. This is all damage control for Ring. Uh, Ring is being pushed into doing these kinds of things because people are very upset at Ring for sharing third-party data without making it absolutely clear, not letting you control or opt out. Uh, so they're doing the right thing. They're saying, okay, we're not going to share analytic stuff till you can opt out. Uh, we're going to let you turn off data sharing for ads uh, if you want. And we're just going to force you all to use second factor. Uh, when when The Verge talked to the CEO of Ring about this at CES, he was implying it would be something that you could opt out of, but it's not. Uh, they're just, uh, from the sound of it, going to make everyone get a second factor, either by text message or email, uh, and use that every time they want to log into Ring, which, okay, that is going to force security on people. Um, so... There are problems when you force security on people where people try to get around it or just stop using a product, but uh, that is going to force security. It's not as good as allowing actual YubiKeys or code generators, uh, but it is better than not having any security on your Ring account. Uh, and of course, if your email is not also protected by 2FA, 
then you really are just pushing, you know, kicking the can down the road with the security <laughs> vulnerability being on your email at that point. And they could still get into your ring account theoretically. Uh, but, you know, th th these are all small steps in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I, I, we've talked quite a bit at length of, of rings missteps, you know, it's, it's not even, I think a, a lot of folks are quick to say, Oh, you know, look what they're doing with the government. And that, that may be true, maybe not uh, be true, but all of these steps are in an effort to gain back trust from their user base. So yeah, it's, uh, it's all, it's pretty, pretty cut and dry. I think there's some misunderstanding that police could go in and get footage out of your ring without your permission. They couldn't. Uh, what was happening is they were allowing police to request footage in a way that a lot of people felt they had to agree to, or they would be suspicious. Right. Uh, so is that power imbalance and, and saying, look, I just don't want to be asked. I don't, I don't want to participate, mm -hmm. uh, is, is an improvement, uh, for ring where they're saying, look, we just won't let the police, we won't let the police know your ring doorbell is even there. Uh, and that way you won't feel pressured if they come along. And a lot of people very happily uh, want to cooperate because they have good relations with the police in their neighborhood mm -hmm. and they're not suspicious of it. Depends on who you are and what neighborhood you're in, though. Well, and it, when it comes to ads, kind of same story, right? Some people are like, well, if I'm going to see ads anyway, they might as well be personalized. If you, you know, if you, if you know what I might like, that would be helpful rather than not helpful at all. Other people are like, nope, don't want to. That should just always be an option for the user. All right. Uh, these days, it's hard to go through tech news without uh, touching at least on the coronavirus in some way. Uh, and we've got a few different points to get to here. Supply chain analytics provider Trendforce has revised a report on smartphone production, uh, which is now projected to decline 12% year on year in Q1 due to issues with the coronavirus making it the lowest quarter in five years. It had been expected that smartphone production would bounce back in Q1 after sort of going flat. So this is unfortunate for the smartphone industry. Uh, Apple warned Monday that it might not reach its previous Q2 revenue guidance of 63 to $67 billion due to the effects of the coronavirus on its supply chains. Manufacturing is resuming in China more slowly than expected, according to Apple. So Apple said the worldwide iPhone supply would be temporarily constrained. And that directly affects you if you're looking for a new iPhone. There might not be one on the shelf. It might be harder to get one. Uh, and of course, it affects Ch Apple's sales because in China itself, Apple stores remain closed or at reduced hours. So they, they just aren't as many opportunities for people to go buy an iPhone. People aren't leaving the house as much anyway because of the scare. Uh, Apple did not offer any new quarterly guidance numbers. Uh, other than to say that they would be affected. Xiaomi also announced an expected impact to its sales. Interestingly, Samsung is expected to feel less impact as half its smartphones are made in Vietnam, and it already had poor sales in China. So people shopping less in China doesn't affect Samsung as much because they just weren't selling it as much to begin with. Uh, and their supply chain should be less impacted because the factories where they have their, their stuff made uh, aren't in the region directly impacted. There's been a little of the impact on cross-border sales. A lot of the components that go into the assembly in Vietnam come from China, and that's been impacted. Uh, but overall, Vietnamese factories for, for Samsung have been churning out uh, units you know, close to what they expected. Yeah, as this story has unfolded, and it's been, it's been a weird one, uh, I, you know, I've, I have friends who are going to South by Southwest in Austin, Texas in March. And, you know, they're sort of like, is it going to get canceled too? And I was like, I don't know why it would. Yeah. The, you know, the <laughs> mobile world Congress would make a lot more sense, but, but okay, this kind of like lasting effect of this and how much it actually does damage more than the next quarter ish, especially for a company like Apple. I mean, it was big news this morning, Apple saying, Hey, we're not going to meet our guidance. We're not going to tell you what we think it's going to be, but it was already kind of a wide range and we're just not going to make it. We know we won't. That That's a big deal because it's Apple. But how much does this really become a ripple effect more than the next three months? Yeah, the 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 general consensus, uh, you know, I, I, I read The Economist, listen to The Economist, BBC and such, is that, you know, out, outside of technology, this is outside of my expertise, but the general consensus seems to be Usually when this sort of thing happens, yes, there's a downturn because of lack of consumption and, and production, but then there's an upturn afterwards because people were just deferring until after. And so you get a spike, but the spike is never enough to fully make up the difference. Yeah. Uh, and so the question is, 
the longer it goes, how much of a difference are you going to have between what was lost and the bounce back effect? Uh, what, what ends up with people just pushing off and saying, look, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to buy that phone or more relevant, like you were saying with Mobile World Congress, you don't go back and do Mobile World Congress. Everything that was going to be spent on lunches and, and, you know, ancillary stuff in Barcelona isn't going to be spent. No one's going to go back and do Mobile World Congress lately, later. So that's just lost. Uh, and, and it's, it's going to have a big effect on technology, the technology industry in general, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. And thanks to everyone who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories. You can vote on other other of your peers' stories as well at DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. You can also join in the conversation in our Discord going on right now, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do that. Uh, an anonymous federal drone... That, that was their, their person or quadcopter. Yep. Hard to say. So uh, they can talk. Uh, it says I work at a federal agency and I just introduced teams. We were talking about Microsoft oh, yeah. teams and Slack with Rob Dunwood on Friday's show. Uh, drone says I've been trying to get my colleagues to bring teams into their workflow. Unfortunately, the key hurdle to this is my workplace's policy that we can't create our own teams and need to submit an IT ticket in order to do so. The integration into Office 365 leads me to believe it would be great for managing VIP travel, keeping team members in the loop in general. Right now, this is being done poorly via email and WhatsApp. The rationale for the IT ticket is that if individuals create teams willy-nilly, it'll burden record retention requirements. However, a lot of that gets lost when we rely on WhatsApp as well as the shared document viewing and editing capability. I'm going to keep up my campaign and hope that when I get into a management position, I'll be a little more technologically nimble than my current bosses. It does sound like a little CYA is going on, which is, look, if we don't know you're arranging travel in WhatsApp, then there's no requirement that we we we, we preserve that. Uh, but if you open a Teams channel, then we know it's there and we have to preserve that. Um, I'd be curious if there's some sysadmins out there who think like, you know what, that's a reasonable concern. Or if they're like, what, you just you just archive it. You know, yeah, you have to pay a little more for your storage space, but it's not that much uh, one way or another. Also, we got a lot of reactions to the Tesla story that we followed up on that Tesla had done the right thing and restored uh, the automatic driving so autopilot functions to the buyer of a used Tesla who was surprised to find that those functions had disappeared, even though they're on the invoice. Uh, James from Irvine points out that tens of thousands of used Teslas have been sold over the past 10 years, and all indications are that 99.9% .9 of the time, software purchases transfer to the new owner without issue. I know it would have been nice if Tesla had issued a statement about this, but I think for them this was a non-story. One mistake was made and fixed, and there is nothing worth talking about. Obviously, many other people didn't see it that way. Uh, remember, this wasn't that transfer didn't happen. It was that Tesla went in with an audit and removed it because the names didn't match. Uh, and James is saying, yeah, but it usually doesn't go wrong. Why are we focusing on the one time it did? Uh, and then Tom McCaig said, in reference to the story on a car losing auto drive features, if Tesla really wanted to connect features to a car, they could use the VIN, not the purchaser name. The VIN never changes. That's the vehicle identification number, but the owner might. I feel that using the original owner's name instead of the VIN shows how immature Tesla is as a car manufacturer. It's either that or Tesla intended to rip off the second <laughs> owner by making them purchase the option again. They just got caught when Jalopnik ran the story. Tom, I would point you to James, who's saying, no, it's probably not that. Uh, but I do like the suggestion that the VIN is a more reliable way to track this stuff. That there's, I wonder if there's, you know, things that we're not seeing that would be a pitfall to that. But it feels like, oh, when someone has bought mm -hmm. it and it's attached to the VIN, if you then then your audit would always be like, oh, that VIN did pay for it. Okay, great. You know, that, that's, that's a good, good insight, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Dr. Carmine M. Bailey, Mike McLaughlin, and Philip Lass. And we have new Patreon reward merchandise to celebrate six years of DTNS. Six years six almost six and a third by the end of march anyway uh if you want to celebrate with us you can get a poster a sticker a mug or a t-shirt with the special dtns six-year logo on it uh just become a patron or if you're already a patron just stay a patron 
uh, starting January 1st, the clock started ticking. So if you stay a patron for three months, you'll get one of these, depending on what level you're at. And you can check all that out at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you'd like to join us live, we'd love to have you. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>